Let me um, congratulate those of you who have come today uh, for this cause and congratulate the students for quality education on their platform and their set of demands, which it seems to me is very urgent. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I must say to you that in the light of the seriousness of the crisis that we have in the United States and in California and elsewhere and in the university system, period, CSUN and all, um, I do not want to sound in a negative note, but I want to say that we should have a full house today about this. Um, and I I do not accuse anyone of being apathetic. I don't think most people in California are apathetic about what's going on. They may not understand it as well. I don't think the students are apathetic. Um, there is a serious threat to public education in California and elsewhere. And quite specifically to the Cal State University system. Uh, it is not an economic crisis at CSUN. It's not an economic crisis at all, in my judgment, in California or elsewhere. The media and the Chamber of Commerce and big business and the federal government and both political parties are not telling the truth about the crisis in the United States. That's the reality. Uh, and it's uh, many areas where this is not happening, but in terms of the economic condition of our people, our 300 and 8 million people who reside in the borders of this land, uh, it is not an economic crisis, it is a political crisis, it's a moral crisis. It's a crisis between what is right and wrong kind of crisis. It is the failure of our nation to look at ourselves and to at least be honest. Uh, the first president of Czechoslovakia, uh, Václav Havel, who was an artist and a writer, an author, a dramatist, who was in and out of jail in Czechoslovakia as he criticized uh, the dictatorial society that developed under the Communist Party in Czechoslovakia after World War II, which was a decision made by the Allies out of World War II, that Czechoslovakia would be more under the influence of the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union armies had swept from the east uh, towards the west and pushed the German occupying and military forces back. It was a decision by the Allies, it was a political decision that said that Czechoslovakia would be under the influence of the Soviet Union and not free to make their own decisions. Uh, Havel, in uh, the late 1980s or so, wrote a very wonderful essay in that many have claimed as a nonviolent essay called Living the Lie. And a part of his point was for his own country and for Europe and for a lot of the world was that if you live the lie that is being told in Czechoslovakia and by the Soviet Union and by the communist, singular communist party, and by the various collaborationists with the party and the condition in Czechoslovakia, then you can never come to a point where there's a chance that honesty and realism and truth living and truth speaking might lead you to some of the steps whereby you can change your condition. And that I lay in the United States. Our problem is not money. The problem is the way we've been governing ourselves under the ages, under the powers 
of big business and a Republican and Democratic Party that have not demonstrated their care for the well-being of the 310 million people and an under our atrocious determination that we will be the military bully of the earth to make the earth do as we tell the earth to do. Under a, a power structure that in itself is destructive. The issue is not money, it is a moral vision, it's a vision of who we are as human beings and it is our unwillingness to demand of the powers that be in the United States, equality, liberty, and justice for all, and a society that is seeking to do right and to do just by each other and by all. I want to pose against that what we have seen already in this year of 2011. Uh, our foreign policies, our military policies that have helped to shape the world being challenged in both Tunisia and Egypt by the raw material of what I call nonviolent struggle that can also be called civil resistance movements. And you see in those instances the collapse of two societies that have been arbitrarily dictatorial and atrocious to their own people backed up by the economies of Europe especially, but also backed up by our own foreign aid to Egypt, which has been something like $14 billion a year for 20 years. We, have, we supported the denial of fundamental human rights in both Tunisia and Egypt until sufficient numbers of the people decided they were no longer going to live in that lie and began to exercise their right to say yes or no and then to join with other people so that literally millions of them in the streets all over those two lands essentially working from a nonviolent civil resistant perspective caused those countries to tumble against the wishes of Europe and against the wishes of the United States, against dictatorial power that was propped up for 20 or 30 years by our own designs. Now that ought to be, we ought to recognize what happened there. Now what follows up there, I have no idea. I'll follow it with some interest, but the point I'm making is there you saw what the power of people who unite around a platform of change who insist that the wrong must be dismantled and that the people have a right to expect from their governments the well-being and the welfare of all the people. That has been an enormous power. I hope we here at CSUN see that enormous power and understand that that power was called by Gandhi and by Martin Luther King Jr. and by a host of other people in the 20th century, nonviolent power. The power of soul force. The power, as Gene Sharp has put it, the politics of nonviolent action. And so building upon that, I want to say to you that our situation has great possibilities for us if we're willing to use it. Um, a part of what you are fighting now, we are fighting in California in all this business of, of public education, is, in my mind, quite simple. The decision and the part of what I like to call plantation capitalism to make public education, both K-12 and higher education, a for-profit enterprise governed by what they think to be 
the free market, which is one of the great lies that are told that is told in the United States. Uh, that's what the Chamber of Commerce has put together across the nation, a huge ballot, huge budget to do. Budgets that are raised not by the small businesses who are parts of the Chamber of Commerce, by, but the big uh, institutions in capitalism that want domination and control. I say this quite deliberately and intentionally. I think it's cowardliness on the part of the males who make many of these decisions, whether in political parties or economic institutions, or even in higher education in California. I think it's cowardly to pretend that we have a financial crisis and then to make students pay for that financial crisis instead of straightening out the issues themselves, as they know full well, can be corrected. I think that's cowardly. So that part of the issue we have to somehow face is the fact that we have people in places of power who are cowardly and lack the character to have a vision about we the people, about our society, and about the possibilities, the unlimited possibilities, of our young. It is my thesis that education from K-12 through higher, le many levels of higher education ought to come from the public dollar and ought to be available to give this nation of ours, California, the finest educational system that any human being, any group of human beings can afford. Now, this was, this was a part of the attraction of California in the 50s and 60s. I don't know if people even want to remember that. Uh, what they're doing now is, and what we must fight, is developing a school system, but developing higher education, where Jackie Robinson could not go to school as he did at UCLA 30, 40 years ago and graduated. Where a Tom Bradley, a graduate of UCLA, mayor of this city of Los Angeles for some 20 years, could, cannot go today. They both came out of sharecroppers' families. They were both among the first members of their families to be able to afford an education and to afford it because public education at that time had not the goal of profit or privatization, not the goal of being for profit, but the goal of helping children and young people become effective and competent human beings for the many, 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 many roles that we human beings must play in the United States and around the world. So I, I push, I think the demands must call for a different vision of education. And what I see in part missing from the demands of the students for quality education is the whole business and civil resistance of engendering another kind of power grid that can change the present power structures both in the CSUN system and the UC system and in the state of California. I don't know if I make that clear. A part of Nonviolent struggle as Gandhi developed it was to say that people had power. They had life power. And that if they bent their power in conjunction with others, not just their family, but beyond their families into the hundreds and the thousands and the ten of thousands and the millions as Egypt, uh, this past winter, Gandhi insisted that that power of the people would forge a new 
power relationship in their society, a power relationship that's not there at the present moment, that would then reshape the power grid. I don't know if that's a better way of explaining it. But nonviolence is not passivity, it is not passive resistance, nonviolence is not pacifism, nonviolence is not being apathetic. Nonviolence means engendering power in such a fashion with the people, of the people, in a fashion that creates a new power equation that the status quo cannot ignore or avoid. That's civil resistance. That's nonviolent resistance. So what I want to try to propose uh, in wrapping this up quite briefly is to say to you that this scene can be reversed probably in five to ten years if we want to do it. But it will require students and faculty working together over a five, ten year period, providing structure and continuity to make that happen. But it will also require students and faculty not to limit the struggle to the university, but to include their families, and their families to include other families to include other civic organizations so that we mobilize a civic society that the banks or the Chancellor Reed cannot avoid. You have very good demands. The second thing about what I want to say in this power grid is that a part of the crisis is due to our bad, immoral, cowardly political parties and political leaders. And I make no hesitation about saying that. Our political parties have fallen down on any kind of responsibility to the 310 million people or the 40 million people in the state of California. They simply do not know us, and for whatever reasons that they're elected officials for the most part, and I do not mean all of them, because I'm quietly having some meetings with some political elected officials about some matters. So I'm not, I'm not trying to denigrate all, but in a general fashion, the political parties are irresponsible. So I wonder, for example, in your plan, quality students for quality education in California Faculty Association, I wonder if you plan, if there ought to be some direct actions aimed at the political parties, not just the legislatures, but at the parties themselves, at the presidents of the parties in California. I wonder if there ought to be some actions planned to go after the kind of extremism that some in the, in the Republican Party and some in the Democratic Party represent. <laughs> to pretend that we can have a quality of life without a fair, decent, meaningful taxation system or systems is, of course, a lie. And I resent the fact that I resent the fact that in the front page of the Los Angeles Times a few days ago, in a major article, it was described how General Electric paid no taxes on their highest profits in 2010, and that they had a whole tax lawyer apparatus that has perfected the gift of making certain that the corporation pays no taxes. FedEx paid no taxes in the year 2010. Many corporations, this is well documented. It's available through scholars who've worked on it, through academics who've written the books and the papers. Well documented. 
We cannot have political parties who play games about the necessity of our caring for our infrastructure, caring for our roads, but especially for our schools and our colleges and universities. So what about a direct action plan that goes after other units in our society that use their power in such an immoral fashion? And then about the final, the last word I want to say is that this can be reversed and changed, not tonight, but in five to ten years it could be systematically reversed. If you develop a five-year plan, a ten-year plan, a serious plan, these goals represent certainly a real beginning. But how do you break these goals down into what we're going to do at CSUN? How do we get the California Faculty Association to come onto the side verbally and by action Quality education at CSUN and in the Cal State system for all students and to stop the hemorrhaging of students because of tuition costs and all and fees. They're cutting out the Jackie Robinsons and the Tom Bradleys uh, and the Cesar Chavez's uh, across, our, across our state. Uh, plan that has strategy in it, that uses mixed action, that develops a lot of people who become powerful spokespeople for this quality education and for what it will take, which develops maybe tens of thousands of people like yourselves and others in every system who become extraordinary voices, informed, courageous, with character, that become a part of a new leadership brand in California. You'd be surprised what the effect of that would be, both students, faculty, their parents, and their families, their clergy, their community leaders and political leaders. You'd be surprised what could happen. Gene Sharp, in his classic book on nonviolent action, uh, collated or gathered from written history 198 different techniques that human beings have used that could be called nonviolent techniques across the last five, six, seven, eight thousand years. 198. We know from our experience in the United States there are many more. Well, what about some people who do some serious examination of those methods that have been used and borrowing from some of those weapons creatively and in a surprising fashion to help build a movement in California that can help you achieve the goals you would like to achieve? I am persuaded that in this generation of ours we can move from the cowardliness and immorality of our times in the public arena, I am convinced that we can move from that, this era, and reverse the process and allow millions of people in California, especially our young people, to discover a different vision. A vision in the first instance, that is a vision of developing a civil resistance movement to say no to the wrong and to say yes with others to the ways in which it can be changed. A vision in which public education for every boy and girl across our land becomes a continuous learning experience in life that allows every boy and girl to tap the infinite potential of life that is in them, a vision that reclaims the notion of equality, liberty, and justice for all. The truth of the matter is that we who want a better society 
a better Los Angeles, a better California, a better world can have it. But as the sweet honey on the rock singers in one of their wonderful songs have said, we who believe in freedom must not rest until it's won. We who believe in equality, justice, and liberty must take the actions in our own lives and the lives of others and not rest and not give the enemies any kind of a rest until we win a new seesaw.